let's talk about citizen initiative and referenda. In our previous session, half of you were here, Senator Anderegg referred to the R word as a swear word. <laughs> and I know that uh, talking to this particular group involving attorneys who often represent real property interests and local officials, that the whole process of citizen review of land use decisions has caused a major kerfuffle, that it's been difficult. It's evolved over some time. But what has happened even more recently has not been a surprise, knowing that some 12 years ago, the Utah Supreme Court, in a case called Carter v. Lehigh, reversed itself and dug in, indicating that they were going to do their darndest to reinforce the constitutional right of citizens to second guess the local city council or the state legislature. And the court has done this basically saying that the citizens more than 100 years ago gave themselves this right in a constitutional amendment and the court has deemed it its duty, awkward duty according to the preamble to the Carter decision, to have to sort this out. The court said, we find ourselves in an uncomfortable situation. I'm grossly paraphrasing because I don't know how to be as eloquent as Justice Lee. We find ourselves in an uncomfortable situation where the judicial branch is trying to sort out how the legislative branch ought to work. But what we learned in that case and has been reinforced, the court has been consistent through a chain of courses, cases that we'll talk about here briefly. And the, the concept is that the legislature the city council, the county commission are co-equal legislative bodies with the people themselves. It's a little easier to get a bill in front of the legislature, if you're a legislator, than it is to get a matter in front of the people. But once the people vote, their vote has exactly the same effect as if the legislature or the city council had enacted it. And yes, the people can second guess the city council. The city council can then turn around and second guess the people. However, the politics are real and the vote of the people on a citizen initiative or the way the people handle a referendum when it comes to them is very unlikely to be overwritten by local officials deciding to once again vote against the will of the people and see how that works as an election strategy. It doesn't. So let's look at some, a little bit about this and then uh, talk more specifically. So only decisions by the legislative body are subject to referenda. That is, can be referred to the voters. Another entity at the city, none of those decisions are referable. So what the Planning Commission does, or the Board of Adjustment, the Appeal Hearing Officer, the Site Plan Review Committee, if it is not the city council, it is not going to be going to the people as a, as a vote on a referendum. A referendum being, of course, undoing a vote that's already happened. The initiative is to create, in the, in this, by citizen initiative, a law that never existed in the first place. And we're familiar with this, this last November, the initiative to uh, legalize medical marijuana, for example, was citizen initiative to create a law that hadn't existed before. Decisions by the council in a mayor council form of government are always legislative. Now there's some footnotes on your flow chart, this colored legal size paper that talks about this if you're really into this. But generally speaking, the court has been specific in the case of uh, Moody v. Sandy and then reinforced this in a later case and said it again. If you have a mayor form of government, strong mayor, and I've listed them here, including Hupper and Mary Slaterville, then the decisions by the city council are very likely to be referable to the voters, every decision they make, because all they do is legislative work. Now, if somebody tries to take a, a pretty obscure decision by a strong mayor city council to the vote, I guess we'll see what the court thinks about that. But that's the best information we have at this point. Some decisions by a city council with a five or six member council form of government and every county commission or the grand city council must be reviewed to determine if they are legislative or administrative. So if you're not a strong mayor form, that is those 13 cities, then when the council makes a decision and somebody says, I want to refer this, then there's a process we go through to decide whether or not it can be referred, whether the voters get their say. Um, I'll try to go through it. It's online and it's also 
in the material in the written form where I've tried to outline the legal law. But let me, even if you can't read this, try to go through it quickly. So things that are always legislative are things like the general plan. To amend the text of land use ordinance or amend to the building and development standards, amendments to the zoning map, including overlay zones and subdivisions, even single lot rezones, annexation, those issues are referable. That's the traditional legislative stuff, and when the council does it, it's subject to referendum. Now, this is the general rule. There may be some tweaks on the other side. On the administrative side, the court has basically said several times, conditional use permits, appeal authority decisions, variances, they've singled those out and said those are always administrative. So if the city council is, ha is handling the approval of a subdivision or a conditional use permit, their decisions are not going to be referable most of the time, almost all the time. I hate to be absolute, but very likely you're on safe ground there. However, if, you, if you're in the straw mayor form of government and the, and the city council decides they want to approve conditional use permits, Katie, bar the door. I mean, it is, it is difficult. That's the kind of case the court hasn't handled yet where they may roll back their previous decisions but it'll be, uh, it could be hard to tell. Other things that are clearly administrative, building permits, business licenses, enforcement of the land use code, enforcement of individual permits or approvals, those kinds of things. Now we'll get into the point that's worth talking about. What's in the middle? Some development agreements, probably less than used to be. Some plan unit developments and some development plans for larger projects, even a site plan for a large project could be and recently has been held to be a legislative act in a five or six member council form of government and thus subject to referendum. So that's our discussion today. So some things um, does not always characterize a legislative act. So the possibility of that might be characterized as administrative. It's not determinative that the decision is expressed as an ordinance, a contract, or a resolution you go to somewhere else for the test. It's not those words. It's not determinative that the legislative body made the decision. If in doubt, how do we determine? So there are some points. This is directly out of the most recent court case to talk about what the court sees as legislative. So laws of general applicability, including single lot rezoning. Weighing broad competing policy considerations, open-ended decisions made without reference to fixed criteria. Administrative acts, when you apply fixed criteria when making the decision. When you apply the law to particular individuals or groups based on individual facts and circumstances and things that are unique to specific facts of an individual case. Now, I'm not here to say that's clear. I'm here to say that's the language in the Baker decision. And then the court applies it, and we know how they applied it, and thus we think, well, if we have a situation like that, that's how the court would apply it. In, it, in its preamble to the Carter decision, the court said, we want, to make, we want to adopt some bright lines, because we don't want the court to be the one to decide what's referable and what's not. Well, fast forward seven years, and guess what? Basically, the court has stepped up and inserted itself as the only entity that can make a decision in this middle area about what's referable and what is not. Most of the time, in the smaller decisions, like a rezone or creating a new kind of zone in the land use ordinance, those are clearly going to be referable and it would be unwise to take it to the Supreme Court. The biggest problem we have is that when we have a big decision and it's complicated, and it's controversial, then that's the kind of time when you have enough steam and energy on both sides of an issue that you're going to end up to the court and, and try to figure out and guess ahead of time how they're going to apply their criteria. So this is the famous quote from Potter Stewart. He was asked and he wrote a dissenting opinion in the case of Jacob Ellis versus Ohio. And the court was trying to decide what hardcore pornography meant. And he said, I could never succeed in intelligibly doing so, that is, describing it. But I know it when I see it. And the motion picture involved in this case is not that. 
So the fact is, we're at a point where the court knows it when it sees it, and when it feels like that the legislative branch, be it the state legislature or the city council, is playing games and trying to limit the ability of the people to vote on a decision of wide application and where there are competing uh, consequences, uh, issues being weighed, then they want to step in and and they want, if they if it's necessary, I guess to far, paraphrase the preamble in Carter, the question is, even though the court's reluctant to sort out what issues should be settled on the legislative branch, if nobody else is willing to do it, they are. So let's talk about a couple of cases. This is the beautiful environs of Moab, down in Grand County. And you'll see the city of Moab kind of up on the left-hand corner, that's the uh, beautiful green area there, and then coming down a little bit, that's Spanish Valley. Did I get that name right? Spanish Valley? Yes, okay. So there's a guy who owns some land in Spanish Valley. Actually, you own this land. It's owned by the State Institutional Trust Lands Administration. A couple of thousand acres up on the hill above Spanish Valley, and it's called uh, John's Over the Top. Anyway, so there's 2,000 acres there. Somebody comes along, gets development approval for it, and then, I know this is hard to believe, sometimes developments don't work out. Another developer came in and stepped into the shoes of the first developer. So they came to the Grand County Council and they said, we want to amend the plan, we want to exchange, the, we want to adjust the boundaries a little bit, there were some mistakes in the survey, we want to reallocate the residences, some of the, you know, have more, less lodge units and more individual townhome units, and we're just going to play with things like that. And, uh, so please pass it. The council passed it. And the citizens immediately went to court. And the, they also went to the Board of Adjustments. And the question in this case, ironically, this is not a referendum case or an initiative, but the court dealt with the same factors in what's administrative and legislative. Because in this case, the people wanted it to be an administrative decision and the county wanted it to be a legislative decision because the legislative decision would be a lot easier to challenge in court. And the people thought, well, no, let's go through the local process. Anyway, whatever the context is, this is what the court came up with. Again, showing the Sitla property south of Moab. So we have uh, 2,000 acres, 372.5 equivalent residential units, a master plan. We amended the plan, as I said. So they said it's a legislative act because it's a new law. We replace the original agreement with a new one. It runs with the land. It provided in, the, in this code they adopted for the development, they, they provided for some deviations and appeals processes to change the, the rules. It created zones within the development. Said this zone is gonna be for our townhomes, this is open space. And so because it did that, the court said, this smells like legislation to us because you're looking at these broad factors. Um, you're weighing broad competing policy considerations and open-ended decisions are what this is about. So again, this is online. It's available on the materials section for this seminar. You have a scan code in your materials. It'll take your smartphone right to the page at utahlanduse.org. Then you'll see these criteria listed more specifically and you won't have to try to photograph or take those notes. But again, it's just an example. Next example. This is the most recent case. It was voted on by the voters of Holiday in November. You may remember fondly the old Cottonwood Mall. I mean, for me, this is the first mall ever existed in the state of Utah. This is like 1962. And of course, that's 10 years before you were born. But for me, this, these are the happy days of my Halicon days of my youth. You know, the Cottonwood Mall. My sister lived close. I mean, I, I really became an urban person at the Cottonwood Mall. Well, it's gone. And the question is, what's going to replace it? Well, Ivory stepped up and said, this is our proposal. Once again, they were amending a previously approved development plan. And the previously approved development plan included two parts. There was a development agreement and the site plan. As those who are most uh, frustrated with this decision refer to it, it's just a site plan. And here it is. There's the site plan, some single family lots, some middle density, I mean, certainly those who had this referendum on their ballot didn't call it middle density, but
but higher density even yet in the red area, in the orange area, some transition. And then right next to the area where the, where the closest residents lived, single family residential lots. So in this case, they held that the site plan approval was a legislative act. Even though the city council said it's just a site plan approval. And Ivory and the city council are on the same side in this issue against the citizens who tried to put it on the ballot. So the, sit, the, the court said, you've designated land, land use zones in this site plan that weren't there before. The mixed use zone that they were challenging had no uses in the mixed use zone. And so for the first time, the uses that are allowed are put into, the, into a, some kind of enactment by the city council. And thus, since there were no uses listed at all, the court said, you're basically creating both a master plan and a zoning ordinance and calling it a site plan. And so basically, since we're going to decide what's legislation and what's not, we're calling it legislation. The ordinance itself said that this site plan would serve in some ways as a general plan for the site. Well, red herring, I mean, red letters for the court to read. And then open-ended decisions made without reference to fixed criteria. They said the ordinance provided that plan to must comply with vision and purpose of mixed use zone. It's too broad, you know, fi no fixed criteria. And they talked about how they, in order to approve this, the town council looked at traffic studies and they, they looked at compatibility with adjoining land uses. And the court said that just is legislative. That's what we do. A couple of things happen that are just interesting to talk about how jealously the court wants to protect the right of the citizens to vote. One of them is that in the oral argument, one of the lawyers said, well, we, we look to the legislature to see what's the difference between administrative and legislative. And one of the justices on the court made a comment on the record and said, we really are not interested in what the legislature thinks the difference between administrative and legislative is. And in another place, in the, in the discussion, it says, in their opinion, they said, well, there is some argument that we ought to give some at least nominal uh, bias or, or uh, importance to the form of the decision. Is it in the form of an ordinance? And in the footnote, they said, that's like letting the fox guard the hen house. In other words, we're not interested in what the local legislative body calls it, whether it's an ordinance or not whether they adopt it as a resolution, we're going to decide again, based on these criteria, on what's going to be a considered referable or created by initiative and what is not. On the other hand, the development agreement was deemed administrative. So the agreement as amended, they said, was administrative. And in the red or in the yellow lettering here, it said that the development agreement was adopted pursuant to the site plan that it was simply a contract between four parties subject to, con to contract law. It's not adopted as part of a comprehensive legislative act. It's not involved, it did not involve important consideration, I mean, sorry, it did involve important considerations, but they were unique to this case. I'm, I'm sorry, I can't explain all this and where the overlaps are. I'm just quoting the court for your benefit. So it's, there are some clues, though, as far as what we can do if we want to try to promote the idea that our decisions are either legislative or administrative. So let me uh, talk about this briefly, and then we'll have a minute to talk about other questions you might have. So these are some things local government could do if they don't want the voters second-guessing what the city council decides. Number one. Delegate all administrative decisions to the Planning Commission and Landmarks Commission, Appeal Authority, or staff. In other words, if the City Council is not making a subdivision decision, then it's not going to be referable. That may be tough. I understand that local elected officials want to be able to implement what they promise the voters they do. But in some cases, they do that at their peril. Again, a straight subdivision is not going to be referable. But that's exactly what the Baker case involved. Ivory was subdividing the Cottonwood Mall site. Second, avoid having the legislative body make administrative decisions such as subdivision approvals and development plans 
They can impose specific criteria to guide those decisions by others. Third, change the form of government from mayor council to another form. I mean, it doesn't make sense for Provo or Ogden, but maybe if it's Hooper, and I said that right, because I live in West Weber myself, it may just not be worth it, that's all. The, the problem in a small town is, this is complicated stuff. And if somebody decides they want to make your decisions, take it to a referendum, it's, it's just as complicated as doing it for Salt Lake City, but you don't have the resources that Salt Lake City has. And it's easier to do it because there's fewer voters in Hooper and easier to get all the signatures that are necessary to put it on the ballot. Create specific criteria that must be followed if the city council decides to make administrative decisions, such as to approve development plans and agreements. So the one way that a city attorney can cautiously, cautiously prepare the stage for the city council to approve that development plan is to set up criteria. For example, the court made a big point in the, in the Baker, that is Cottonwood Mall case, that the city had to look at traffic studies and certainly traffic studies are matters of broad public concern. Well, what if the code said that the applicant must show by traffic study that these criteria are met, you know, that the traffic is accommodated, that level of service stays at a certain level, or those kinds of things? My guess is you take a big, broad policy issue like traffic and distill it into more administrative level for what it's worth. Assign a list of permitted uses to any mixed-use zones. Don't leave open-ended with no limits on the allowed uses. So this is the easy thing for Holiday to do the next round, is assign some uses in those zones. And the decision to assign uses in the zone will be a general nebulous decision that the voters are unlikely to challenge. Whereas approving a site plan, we're going to put townhomes here and houses here and commercial here, much more specific and thus much more controversial. Adopt complex approvals as separate legislative and administrative acts. Don't approve the zone change and the development agreement in the same ordinance. So in Suarez, that Grand County case, it was all rolled into one ordinance and thus was easily styled as legislative. In Baker, in the Cottonwood Mall case, one of the decisions ended up being administrative and one of them ended up being legislative. So that was of some help. Now, I've left you in total confusion, so help me clarify. Where does that leave us? What do you think? What are your thoughts and questions? Wasted 30 minutes, huh? Yes. So it's specific to the mayor council form of government. Holiday is not a mayor council form of government. Go ahead. Well, or whatever form, whatever form Holiday is. Which is, what are they? So typically, they're a six or five council form. Okay. So what I'm saying is, if you're in the mayor council form, you're likely, all your city council um, decisions are much more likely to be held referable. But if you're, all the rest of us that are not one of the 13 cities listed, then these rules apply to you all the time. They might apply to a strong mayor council, maybe if the court went that far again, but the rest of these rules apply to everyone else. Thank you. So, did I understand that correctly when you said that the development agreement can be an, an administrative decision? In fact, in the Cottonwood Mall case, it was held to be an administrative decision. But in Beaver County, it was held to be a legislative decision. And that involved the development of the uh, ski resort in Beaver County. And, and the court, this is an older case, and in that case the court said, well, the city, the county commission called it a legislative act, so we're going to say okay. But that was then and this is now. But typically, um, development agreements after the Cottonwood Mall case are probably less likely if the attorneys involved are careful to make sure it doesn't look like we've covered a whole lot of new policy with them. I wish I had a feeling that everybody got a crystal clear view of this, but I'm not getting that because I don't have it myself. Other questions or comments? We'll be, of course, talking about the details through the day. But this is where the legislature shows up on the scene in 2019. And that's what our next panel will take on. So after, after the Baker case, after Cottonwood Mall, where does that leave us? How do we try to avoid this kind of 
unpredictability. Because there's one thing the development community wants more than anything, they just want to get their hands around it and say, what is predictable? If we are trying to redevelop something like the area on, uh, I guess it's uh, ninth, 10th East and about 90th South where there's a Walmart and a Lowe's, that went through a referendum. And the people put it to the ballot box and the people of Sandy voted to go ahead with the development. But certainly those that are trying to develop that kind of project and the city leaders who would like to see some kind of uh, incredible cash benefit like comes from a project like that would like it to be more predictable. And, would, and one thing about that case is when the court said the referendum was valid, the court also said, we're sorry the developer might have commitments to the land might be under option, the, con the financing might be contingent on time frame, there might be all kinds of loose ends that this aggravates. But the court said the power of the people to vote is overwhelming here. It's a clear and compelling reason why your vested rights are on hold until we find out whether the city voters support this project or not. Mm -hmm.